Welcome back to Beyond the Sketch. I've got someone whose work literally lives in the eye of the storm. He's an extreme weather and disaster scientist who's conducted field work in 23 hurricanes, countless severe thunderstorms, and even earthquakes in North America. He's the scientist the media calls when chaos hits, from CNN to the Weather Channel, and here today on Beyond the Sketch, Dr. Hurricane Hal Needham. Welcome to the show. Hey, Brittany. So excited to be here. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very honored to have you here. And before we were recording, we kind of mentioned that we met at CNC. So I think that's a good place to start. Can you tell us what you're doing uh, for CNC right now? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think you and I met at the CNC Connect conference in Mobile. CNC Catastrophe and National Claims, they've been helping people get their lives together on the back end of disasters for more than 30 years. They're a family-run business. And uh, you know what I love about CNC? They're very innovative. And they reached out to me as an extreme weather scientist and came up with the idea of launching GeoTrek. It's an educational platform where we do everything from podcasting to teaching, to going to conferences, all about engaging with folks and helping them understand extreme weather and disasters in in a better light. Awesome. And if we were to backtrack a little bit, how did you find your way into the world of extreme weather science? You know, I always was passionate about extreme weather since I was about four years old. My grandma and my mom both loved nature and the environment. I remember my grandma and I used to have a competition well, I grew up in the northeastern states. We'd always guess which day would be the first snowfall. Things like that were just normal growing up. So I grew up in the land of snowstorms. But for some reason along the way, I just have ended up living in a lot of places with with extreme weather. I lived in North Africa in the Middle East for several years where I spent a lot of time in the Sahara Desert, one of the hottest places on Earth. And then I lived in interior Alaska for several years, one of the coldest inhabited places on the planet. But the last 17 years have been along the Gulf Coast in Louisiana and Texas, where hurricanes are the big thing. But, you know, we have a lot of different hazards that can impact your life and your home as well. Wow. So how does it feel watching a Category 5 hurricane unfold in Jamaica in real time? Well, Brittany, as we're recording this, a Cat 5 hurricane is literally moving across Jamaica. It's hard to see it. You know, once you've been through upper level hurricanes, you know what these folks are in for. It's it's just almost impossible to really build for a Cat 4 or Cat 5 hurricane. That'll be catastrophic damage to even well, well, well-built buildings. So it's hard to see this. It's hard to know what's going on and that a lot of, you know, innocent people are in harm's way. It's something we never want to see, but unfortunately it seems to happen almost every year. And considering um, that you've worked in forensic analysis after disasters, uh, is there any advice that you would, you know, give the people of Jamaica right now? You know, the main thing is surviving the storm. And uh, especially the thing about hurricanes They really put three major hazards. The first one, we think about wind. We have a category system based on uh, the wind speed. The higher the category, the stronger the wind. Uh, For a a wind event like this, I mean, they're looking at sustained winds. These aren't gusts of 185 miles an hour. It's it's almost like a, a wide tornado, if you will, but it's a hurricane. The main thing they would need to do to survive is just to try to put as many walls between themselves and the elements. So if you can go into an interior room, if you're ever in an upper end hurricane like that, if you can go into an interior room without windows or doors, try to take refuge, maybe going under a desk, having a mattress over you. Uh, Those things can protect you from the wind. Beyond that, we think about the flooding as well. We have uh, saltwater flooding on the coast, which we call storm surge. And then with this storm in Jamaica, they're going to have a lot of inland flooding. It's very mountainous. This is a slow-moving storm. And the concern is really for uh, flooding along streams and rivers that could last for days. And then as well, they can get a lot of landslides and mudslides in these mountains. So the main thing is surviving the storm. It's going to be a long road to recovery. But at least if you survive the storm, you, you can do that with uh, with your community. Let's pull the curtain back on what you do in your research. When you say data-driven risk analysis, what kind of data are you collecting in the middle of these storms? Yeah, you know, one of the things I do when we think about hurricanes, for example, we think about the wind. But actually, more people die and there's more destruction to the build environment from flooding than from wind. Uh, one of the most devastating kinds of flooding in a hurricane is from 
storm surge. This is a massive wall of salt water that moves on shore. I actually run the U.S. storm surge database, and it's become an international storm surge database where we go back even several hundred years to identify what are the high water marks in flood prone communities. And a lot of this work involves going deep into the archives. We've been talking about Jamaica today. This week, I was doing some historic research and found there was a storm surge as high as 16 feet. Can you imagine a 16-foot wall of seawater hitting your town? That happened way back in 1722, so over 300 years ago. But it's the same physics today. So we can use those historical measurements to get an idea of flood potential. I also go out into actual storms to measure high water marks on buildings, on trees, anything I can find. Uh, really collecting the data and knowing what's happened, it can help us predict what might happen in the future uh, when we run our, our weather models to predict uh, future floods. What exactly separates a forensic weather analysis from a meteorologist as far as what we see on TV? Oh, it's a great question, Brittany. You know, we watch the evening news and we see a local meteorologist. They're really focusing on forecasting weather this week, right? Is it going to be sunny this weekend? Is it going to rain on Tuesday? They're really understanding how the weather works to give you a forecast of what you can expect in the upcoming days. With forensic meteorology, we're using the same principles of how the atmosphere works, but we're looking backwards. We're going back, especially at extreme weather events, hail storms, hurricanes, floods. We're trying to reconstruct what, what most likely happened. And for example, big hail in severe thunderstorms, uh, that can really damage roofs. And so with forensic meteorology, we'll go back and look at a, a historical thunderstorm and say, how likely is it that that storm produced big hail in this particular neighborhood? So we're actually looking back at the weather instead of looking forward. Got it. And do you have any Jim Cantori style stories? You know, along the way, I uh, I ended up meeting Jim Cantori. Believe it or not, I was at a I was at a party with with my wife, who does not even work in the weather industry, and she introduced me to Jim Cantori of all of all people. Wow. It's a running joke we have to this day. But I've gotten to know Jim. He came on our podcast and shared his stories of surviving Hurricane Katrina in coastal Mississippi. Brittany, I was talking about these walls of salt water. The biggest storm surge, biggest wall of salt water that ever happened on record in the Western Hemisphere was Katrina's surge in Mississippi. It was between 28 and 29 feet high, and it came in all of a sudden. Jim Cantori himself, we were just talking about this uh, a few weeks ago. He was in the veterans' home in coastal Mississippi, uh, in near Biloxi, he was helping the veterans. And all of a sudden, the water came rushing in the building. Jim Cantori, some of his other colleagues with the Weather Channel, they were actually able to take these veterans that were, some of them disabled, and carry them up flights of stairs to save their lives. I mean, you, if, you, if you watch Jim Cantori's coverage, he's incredibly dynamic. But hearing him tell his Katrina story, I was sitting on the edge of my seat. Wow. And speaking of the Western Hemisphere, for now, the U.S. has avoided a direct hurricane landfall. Statistically, does that mean that a hurricane is due? Have we just been lucky this year? And we know that the adjusters have been feeling a little unlucky in some areas. What's your take on our weather here in the States? You know, this has been an unusual hurricane season. Typically, we will see some impacts in the U.S., either from tropical storms or hurricanes. This year, we've had 13 named storms so far, which is really close to the seasonal average. But we haven't had as much as a, even a tropical storm make landfall in the U.S. So from our perspective, living in coastal environments in the U.S., or say you're an adjuster or you work in the insurance industry, this is a really unusual season. You're used to being busy at this time of the year. You get into September, October, uh, you, you're used to being busy. And this year, it's been very quiet. Um, that said, we have had hurricane activity. We've had 13 named storms, five hurricanes. And check this out. We've had three hurricanes that are cat fives. So that hasn't happened for 20 years. You have to go back to year 2005 to find mm -hmm. at least three cat fives. So the storms have been out there. They've just mostly been staying out to sea. Understand. So... I know that you guys have uh, been dealing like with litigation and you've done expert witness testimony. How is science starting to show up in the courtrooms? Yeah, you know, I think more and more the litigation teams say, well, hang on a second. If we have 
a scientific expert that actually can stand on the proof of evidence and the proof of science, their voice is going to hold some weight. And so I do a lot of work in litigation, expert witness work in court. And to be honest, a lot of times it's just looking back at, at the data and you're just building a case. What was most likely based on the data we have when it comes to severe thunderstorms, for example, we have a lot of different kinds of data. The National Weather Service records data on rainfall and wind speeds and And we also have an archive of radar. So radar basically shows that map of where storms are. A lot of folks don't realize this, but we have a very enhanced archive of where all these storms have been historically. So an expert can really go back through those scientific data and and stand on solid ground to really reconstruct what most likely happened in court. So kind of switching gears, we have something that we like to do here on Beyond the Sketch, which we call our lightning round. So I'll ask a couple questions and just, you know, whatever comes to your mind uh, first. Are you ready? I love it. I'm I'm ready to go. Strongest storm you've ever been in? Hurricane Ian, 2022. I think I was in Punta Gorda. I think sustained winds were 130 to 135. I had never seen anything like that before. Favorite movie or documentary on a storm? I've been watching the Katrina Netflix documentary series, and I'm, I'm literally on the edge of my seat. So that that comes to mind. Perfect Storm was great. I mean, there are so many, um, you know, depending on what type of weather. But um, there are a lot of good ones out there. I've been watching the Katrina one, and it's really good. Favorite field gear or gadget that you won't travel without? That's a great question. Um can I say two of them actually? Two come to mind. Absolutely. A battery backup for my phone. I mean, that's essential um, because you uh-huh. need to stay in communication. But also, I love having a headlamp. And a lot of people are like, why do you wear why are you wearing that thing until the lights go out and it's the middle of the night? When you have a headlamp, your hands are free, you can move around. It's like daylight for you. I love having a headlamp when I go into storms. And last question: have you ever been on a hurricane hunter? You know, I have not been on a hurricane hunter. I do not have a good stomach for roller coasters and things like that. So I would probably would not enjoy the experience. I know people that like roller coasters and they don't mind that. Um, I, I know there's a lot of turbulence in those hurricane hunters because they're flying through the eye wall to get to the eye of the hurricane. For whatever mm-hmm. reason, I would feel more comfortable like in the jungles of the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico with a barometer in my hand, cat five winds. I'm fine with it as long as my feet are on the ground. Okay. And speaking of hurricane hunters, and I'm not sure if this is factual, you'll know better than me, but I read something online where they were saying that the hurricane hunters flew into, I believe the current hurricane is Melissa, and that they maybe had to fly back out or I don't know. Did you hear anything on that? You know, it's it's amazing. One of the reasons our models are actually so good for hurricane forecasting is because of the hurricane hunters. They're flying into these most intense storms on Earth to collect Mm -hmm. data, and they have to face a lot of turbulence. They have to go through the eye wall. Uh, I really need to go back. This has been an extremely busy week with uh, with Hurricane Melissa blowing up. I did hear some reports that they had to reroute and do things. I know they they take their safety uh, is paramount for them, and they've never lost a Hurricane Hunter plane. I did hear some reports that they had to do some rerouting. I'm, I'm going to look into that, but I know they're impor- they're very interested to collect data, but they're even more interested in doing it in a safe manner that protects their pilots and their crew. So uh, I'll have to look into that, but I, I think there might have been some rerouting. Okay. And this is probably a silly question, but is it the military that's flying the hurricane hunters into the storms or? That's that's a great question. Actually, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they're, they're really uh, the National Hurricane Center, National Weather Service. They're under NOAA. NOAA has planes and also the Air Force will send planes. And sometimes you'll actually see those two different planes flying uh, different missions in the storm. Um, so mm-hmm. so really, they'll, we'll get coverage from both of those entities. Okay. I appreciate you answering that because for some reason, Noah always sounded so official to me that I'm like, that has to be a government agency. <laughs> yeah. And, and Noah is, uh, is with, is through the federal government with the department of commerce. And then obviously okay. the air force, you're, you're getting into the branches of the military there, but you know, mm-hmm. it, it's really interesting because we have invested in flying into hurricanes now for, for more than 50 years to collect data. And it's just so important. And so many people benefit it from it, not just in our country, but in all these other countries that are vulnerable to hurricanes. When you're flying yes. in, you're getting those data. Your models are going to be so much better. It's going to help everyone out on the forecast. 
Okay. And zooming out, what does studying extreme weather teach you about human behavior and resilience? You know, I really love this question because when you said human behavior, uh, my background is really science. And what I, I spend usually a week or two a year in a disaster zone. And what I've encountered that's fascinating in, in the last decade or so is just a lot of really interesting psychology and how people think about storms. And when, when we think about people's behavior and their perception, one of the main things I see is that people say, hey, I've lived here for 35 years. I've never had a hurricane blow my roof off. I've never flooded. And 35 years from human perspective is a long amount of time. So they start getting complacent and thinking, I'm never going to flood. I'm never going to have wind damage on my roof. And all of a sudden a storm hits and they're complacent and flat footed. And then their house is destroyed or they take on a serious damage. And I've seen this more times than I can possibly count. People just in shock, people mm -hmm. in disbelief. People saying, how could this happen? I lived here 40 years. We never had this happen before. 40 years for us is a long time. For Mother Nature, it's a blink of an eye. So like what we're seeing in Jamaica right now, there are wind speeds that no one in living memory has ever seen. And so we always have to be prepared for Mother Nature to show us something that we have not seen in our lives. If we're prepared for that, if we're erring on the side of caution, we're going to be a lot better in the long run. Do you feel that we're getting better or worse at preparing for these events globally? That's a great question. Um, it, it really depends. I think in a sense, maybe better. There's more education now. There's more resource in, the, in it. Something amazing now that I think helps to some degree with our advanced technology, we can actually see what storms have done in other communities. And that's so important because again, our neighborhood might only get hit every hundred years or every 200 years. But if we can see other communities and what these disasters look like in them, it can really raise awareness. So in that sense, I think we may be better prepared. That said, we have a much higher population in vulnerable areas. Like for example, the first two decades of this century, we increased the coastal population in coastal parishes and, and counties by 9 million people. So we have a lot of people in harm's way. And that kind of, you know, counters that. We have more exposure, more resources now, but we also have a lot more people and a lot more stuff in harm's way. And before we wrap, can you let our audience know, which some of them are adjusters, uh, we've got insurance carrier clients. What would you like to let everyone know as far as how can you help them in their workflow? Yeah, for sure. Um, I will say the forecasting I do is really based on impacts. And so essentially, when it comes to severe weather, when it comes to hurricanes, what people really want to know at the end of the day, whether they're residents or they're professionals, they want to know, is my neighborhood going to be you know, impacted by wind? Is my neighborhood going to flood? It's what we call impact-based forecasting. As opposed to, for example, when you have a hurricane out there, you get a lot of meteorologists talking about wind shear and about the air pressure. And for a lot of people, this is just noise. They just want to know what's, what's most likely to happen in my community. Uh, one of the resources that I'm providing really on social media through GeoTrack and through the Hurricane Hal social media pages, I'm really providing what I call the HAL index, the Hazard Area Likeliness Index. I'm simply taking the forecast I'm taking critical hazard thresholds, like how likely are you to flood or how likely is your roof to see wind damage? And I'm just translating that into basic language. So if your risk is less than 10%, I'll say it's unlikely. 10 to okay. 50%, I'll say it's possible. Once I say it's probable, my listeners know it's a 50 to 90% chance that you're going to get that roof damage or that flood. And then over 90%, I'll say it's likely. And that's just a, a way just to connect with people. Again, it's very based on impacts. And I try to strip out the jargon. I try to strip out any, any of the hype or even just these confusing terms that don't really relate to you. So uh, I think one of the resources I can provide, you can go to Hurricane Howl. On especially on Facebook or on, on other social media handles, LinkedIn as well. And then you can also always follow GeoTrek. We provide a great podcast and different educational resources, not only to prepare you for an active storm, but in the case of our GeoTrek podcast, it's one of the leading 
uh, radio shows or podcasts on natural disasters, that will equip you with a lot of resources long term to plan and prepare for your work uh, doing work with natural disaster recovery. How this was powerful. I really appreciate that you stopped by to speak with us today. If you want to hear more from Dr. Needham's insights, as he mentioned before, definitely check out his GeoTrack podcast. It's a masterclass on how science meets survival. This has been Beyond the Sketch, powered by Sketch My Roof, where we turn chaos into clarity, and we'll see you next time.